Romans 5.17 For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And of course, we've been talking about grace for the last several weeks. And grace is the unmerited, unearned and undeserved favour of God. It's also um, another definition of grace is divine influence upon the heart. And still another definition would be God's ability working through us. God's ability working through us. And um, there's many aspects to grace, but notice here that to reign in life, we need two things. And these are not two things that we have to work for. These are two things that we just receive, simply receive from God. And the number one is the, the abundance of grace. And number two is the gift of righteousness, which is right standing before the Father. And I'm finding out more than more that you can't really come to appreciate the gift of righteousness until you appreciate what the grace of God really is demonstrated through Jesus Christ. Now let's also look down in verse um, 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift to all men, resulting in justification of life. And that just simply means that under the law, which nobody could keep, there was judgment, there was condemnation, there was guilt, there was shame, there was failure. But through the gift of Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous simply because Jesus fulfilled the law for us. Okay? He did what we were unable to do. And not only that, on the cross, he received all the punishment and the condemnation, all the guilt and the shame and God's anger poured out on him as our sacrifice, as our substitute, so that we didn't have to receive it. And so later on, we're going to look at this whole thing of condemnation. But notice verse 19, for as by one man's obedience, many were made sinners. Think about that for a moment. Sorry, as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now think about that. You know, what did we have to do to receive that from Adam? Absolutely nothing. Just basically be born. All we had to do was be born into the world to partake of the sin nature um, because of one man's disobedience. That man being Adam. Okay? And notice that we aren't sinners because we sinned. The Bible says we're sinners because of one man's disobedience. Okay? So we didn't become a sinner because we sinned. No, we sinned because we were a sinner because of one man's disobedience. Does that make sense? Okay? In other words, it wasn't our works, it wasn't our bad works in this case that caused us to be sinners any more than it's our good works that causes us to be righteous. Okay, so through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. See, that's the contrast right there. Okay, now some people will say that it's because of our obedience that we become righteous or because it's because of our obedience that God blesses us. But no, not so. In the New Testament, it's because of one man's obedience that we receive the gift of righteousness. It's because of one man's obedience that we're blessed. And so there's many contrasts between the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of them is that uh, in the Old Testament, blessings follow obedience. But in the New Testament, obedience follows blessings. Okay? In other words, you get blessed as a free gift from God and your obedience comes out of that. Just like repentance in the Old Testament, you had to repent to receive the blessings and the goodness of God. In the New Testament, you receive the goodness of God and then you repent. Because it says in Romans that his goodness leads us to repentance. And for an example, do you remember uh, Peter? When he was, uh, he'd been fishing all night with his mates, caught nothing. And then Jesus comes along and wants to use his boat to teach the crowds. And then he says to Peter, Peter, I want you to launch out into the deep and chuck your net in and catch a load of fish. And so Peter receives this huge blessing from the Lord. He receives all this net breaking load of fish. And after he sees the goodness of God, what does he do? He falls on his knees in the boats and, and, and says to, to the Lord, depart from me from I'm a sinful man. You see, he didn't repent first. No, the goodness of God led him to repentance. 
And so it's the blessing of God in the New Testament that leads us to repentance. Righteousness is another one, isn't it? In the Old Testament, you had to work for righteousness. But in the New Testament, righteousness works for you. The work of righteousness, Isaiah says, will be peace. And the fruit of peace will be everlasting life. Okay. And so what about the lepers? In, in the Old Testament, if you touched a leper, you became unclean. But in the New T Testament, if the leper touches you, he becomes clean. And things like that. Jesus, in the Old Testament, you know, you couldn't hang around certain people. But in the New Testament, Jesus was a friend of sinners. You see, we don't get contaminated anymore in the New Testament. We contaminate people with the righteousness of God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Hallelujah. And so there's a whole lot of different contrasts. And this new covenant is a better covenant. But it's all because of one man's obedience. It's not because of our obedience. No, obedience is a fruit, but it's not the root. But it's Jesus. It's all, it's all about Jesus. This whole new covenant is everything about Jesus. Grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. Now let's look at another foundation scripture, Acts 20, 32. Book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 32. I said to you the other week, I said, why, why do we ever even bother to read the word of God? What's our motivation? Is it to come up with a list of 10 things that I must do that day? Why do I read the Bible? Well, according to Paul, in Acts 20, verse 32, speaking to a group of people, he had just spent three years with these guys, night and day, preaching to them the whole counsel of God. And he's about to leave them. And verse 31 says, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul poured his whole life into these people. Everything he knew, everything that was in his heart for three years, he poured it into the, uh, the church at Ephesus. And, uh, but notice what he says in verse 32, now that he's departing from them. He says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. Okay, did you notice that phrase there, the word of his grace? It's kind of a synonymous term. With, sometimes the word is called the word of faith. We use that from Romans chapter 10. But here he's called it the word of grace, which is able to do two things. It's able to build you up and it's also able to give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. So whenever we read the, the word of God, especially in the New Testament, we can expect two things to happen. We can expect to be built up and we can expect to get a revelation of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. What has Jesus done for me? What has he left me? What can I re freely receive? because of Jesus' death on the cross. Now let's go to John chapter 1, which will be our third foundation scripture. There's just so many on grace. If we went to John chapter 1, verse 14, and just read those few verses down to verse 17. John chapter 1, verse 14 to verse 17. And you know, I don't believe you could, anybody could really understand grace until Jesus Christ came on the scene. Because grace is not a doctrine. Grace is not a teaching. Grace is not something you can communicate on the page. Grace is a person. And so we couldn't fully appreciate the grace of God under the old covenant. It was impossible because there was no one that could faithfully represent God. Every human being was fallen and, and was, you know, was not born again. So there was no one who could faithfully represent God in the Old Covenant. So this is what happened in John 1.14. It says, And the Word, capital W for Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. That's another word for goodness. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we find really that Jesus was a composite of two things, grace and truth. And... Uh, so you can't really have grace apart from Jesus and you can't have truth apart from Jesus. Jesus Christ was the personification. In other words, he was grace and truth in person. So whereas the law was like a rigid, hard, inflexible document chipped in stone and without mercy, grace is warm, it's friendly, it's kind, it's merciful, it's compassionate. 
as displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? Full of grace and truth. And you know what? We find Jesus at age 12. The Bible says that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That word favor is exactly the same word for grace. It's charis in the Greek. And so we could say he grew in, in grace with God and man. So even at age 12, we see grace and truth working together in the life of Jesus. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, some people say, you know, if you preach too much grace, well, people might just think that they could just live anyhow they want because, you know, God's not going to condemn them. God's not going to get mad with them. And they're going to run off and do some dumb things. Well, apparently Jesus, who was full of grace, lived a perfect life. Yeah. <laughs> he was full of grace and truth, and he never sinned once. So what does that tell us? It tells us that grace and truth working together is actually going to make us or cause us to enable us to live a better life. I just want to be careful what word I use because the minute you start talking about working for it, you know, you're back under the law. So his grace empowers us to live a better life than we ever thought we could. And it's not because we're trying to. It's because simply because we want to, because that's what grace does. We looked at that a bit last year. Um, let's look at verse 16. I love this verse. And it says, And of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. Hallelujah. That's why I believe, in fact, we should... Um, we'll move back to that other scripture in Romans 5 in just a second. Um, verse 17 says, For the law was given, or we could say was sent through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that's all what we see in Jesus' life as we see grace and truth in operation. We're going to look at some examples of that today. But let's go back to Romans 5.17. There was just one other little nugget I wanted to share there. Romans 5.17. If by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now, the word receive there is a word that means continually receive. So in other words, it's not just a one-off. You know, when you ask Jesus to come into your life, yes, you receive grace. Yes, you receive the gift of righteousness, but that's not the last time you're supposed to receive it. It's like that one be being filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. It's a present active uh, event, be being filled. And this is, this is basically saying keep receiving Grace, keep receiving the gift of righteousness, okay? Now, why is that? Now, I, I could understand why you would want to keep receiving grace. I could understand that, stand that quite easily. But the gift of righteousness, I couldn't understand that so easily. I thought maybe if you just received that when you got born again, now you're righteous. Why, why do you need to receive any more righteousness? And the Lord gave me the answer to that in Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, God gave me the answer I was looking for. Romans 1.16 and 17. Just give you a moment to find it. It's a great couple of scriptures. Romans 1.16 and 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the, it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, so the gospel, the good news reveals the righteousness of God. In other words, the gift of righteousness that God has promised to us through Jesus. Now, the thing is, when, when, when we hear more and more of what Jesus has done, we get more and more revelation of our righteousness. So in other words, it's an ongoing revelation. Notice there it says in verse 17, it says, The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The Amplified Bible says springing from faith and leading to faith. Okay, so as we get a revelation of our righteousness, we get a certain level of faith. But as we get more revelation of who we are in Christ, we go to another level of faith. In other words, we grow in our righteousness. Okay, So it's like we receive the gift of righteousness, but we receive more revelation of it as we grow in our Christian life. Mm 
And of course, the more revelation that you get of something, the more you can receive it. If you don't have a revelation of healing, it's very hard to receive the gift of healing. But if you have a revelation of that Jesus died on the cross, not only for our sins, but our sicknesses, if that becomes revelation, then you can receive. So the more revelation we have about the righteousness, the more we get to receive it. And so, yes, it is an ongoing thing. We receive grace, we receive righteousness. Now, let's just take an Old Testament scripture about Jesus in the book of Psalms. Psalm 45. This is a song about Jesus, especially from verse uh, 2. This is talking about Jesus here. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. So what does that tell us about Jesus? Every time he spoke, it's like grace just poured out from his lips. The unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. And, you know, people picked up on that. It was like people wanted to be around Jesus because this, when you're spilling out grace, it attracts people. You know, when, remember when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, he came down. It drove the people away. The people were terrified. But whenever Jesus came down from the mountain, the crowds came to him. You see the difference? Under law, people go away because there's judgment, there's condemnation. But under grace, people come because they know they'll be accepted. They know they'll find forgiveness. Let's look at a beautiful story in um, Luke chapter 7 that will just illustrate this. Luke chapter 7, yeah, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It's just an example of people picking up on the grace that was poured on Jesus' lips. Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And the Pharisee's name happened to be Simon. Now, it was customary in those days, if you were a guest at someone's house, because of the, um, the roads, they had dirt roads, and also the animals shared the roads with the people. So if you didn't look where you were standing, <laughs> you can imagine what's getting all over your feet. So it was customary in those days, if you come to someone's house, that they would have a bowl of water, and a towel and somebody would actually maybe have a servant that would actually wash your feet at the door because likely your feet would be soiled from your journey because they only wore sandals and so forth. And, uh, but on this case, um, nobody treated that Jesus in that way. And, but notice verse 37, Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. So this woman had a reputation. We don't know. She may have been a prostitute, but she certainly had a reputation in the city as a sinner. And, um, but I, I think that this woman knew something about Jesus. I'm pretty sure this woman had, had tasted of the grace that was flowing from Jesus' life. And she was attracted to Jesus you know, in the right way. Not like some of these Hollywood movies that they try and portray Jesus in the wrong way. And I think she knew that the Pharisees but probably would not wash Jesus' feet when he came in the door. Because, you know, the Pharisees gave Jesus the hardest time, didn't they? The sinners and the tax gatherers loved Jesus, but the Pharisees, the religious people, they hated Jesus. They were very threatened by him. Why? Because they were so steeped in the law and the commandments, and they believed that they had become righteous because they were uh, keeping the law perfectly externally. Although, remember, Jesus identified that in their hearts they, they weren't keeping the law. And, and so this woman, I believe she wanted to honor Jesus. I really do. And so um, she came into the house with this alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, most likely, this alabaster flask of fragrant oil and perfume, most likely that she bought that with the money that she got from prostitution. Okay, so you can imagine now some religious people wouldn't like this. Okay, but this didn't trouble Jesus at all. Verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. You know, she did a beautiful thing for Jesus. She noticed that no one had cleaned his feet, and she comes in with her livelihood, and she gets down and she's weeping, and, and she begins to wash 
his feet with her tears and then dry his feet with her hair and then pour this costly perfume and oil on his feet. And uh, notice the response now from the Pharisees, verse 39. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Now, verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. You understand all that language there? There's somebody who had a lot of money. He lent some money to two people. And so the one who had the money was the creditor. The ones who received the money were debtors. They owed money to the guy who had lent them the money. One owed 500 denarii. Now, that's a lot of money. A denarii is a day's wage. So one of them owed 500 days wages. So... That's probably the equivalent of working days, so probably the equivalent of two years' salary. So we could be talking, what's an average wage today? $50,000? We could be talking in the region of $100,000, somewhere around that. Okay? Quite a lot of money to owe somebody, isn't it? 100000 The other one, 50, 50 days' wages. Okay? So it uh, could still be quite a lot of money. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you've rightly judged. Okay, so here's a picture, obviously, of God the Father forgiving us of our debt, which was substantial. It was a debt that we could not repay. And he says, who's going to love more, the one that was forgiven more or the one that was forgiven less? Obviously, the one that was forgiven more is going to love more. And you see the deal here, this woman who was known as a sinner, she was forgiven much. And so she loved Jesus much. But these Pharisees who didn't believe they needed to be forgiven, maybe only just a little bit, they didn't even love him enough to wash his feet, to do the dignity of just what they would do for, to a common guest, just wash his feet. They, they called Jesus. This man would know who this woman is if he was really a prophet. They didn't honor him. Why? Because they felt that they didn't need forgiveness. But isn't it interesting that this woman, she did that beautiful act, not before that she was forgiven, but after she was forgiven. You see, he who, she who has forgiven much will love much. So how was it? She obviously knew that she was forgiven before she did that. Maybe even before she came into the house. There was something about the grace pouring from Jesus' life that spoke of forgiveness. You see, Jesus had the opportunity to condemn that woman, but he didn't. He didn't condemn her. And so she sensed that forgiveness somehow, and she sensed that acceptance from Jesus, and that's why she loved much. And she poured that fragrant oil upon us. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? It's a beautiful picture. Okay, now let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Let's get into this, this condemnation thing, because I'll tell you what, condemnation is a killer. Condemnation kills. What is condemnation? It's a, it's a damning judgment or a damning sentence that sentences people um, to punishment, basically. And that's what the law did. The law condemned. But notice in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, I'm just going to read just the first few verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, just go back to verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, no damning sentence to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, I only found out recently that the last part of that verse is not in the original Greek language. You know, these Bibles were translated into English from the original Greek manuscript. 
And uh, the last part of that verse is not in the original Greek manuscript. Okay? And uh, being a teacher, I had to check that out. I wouldn't just take someone's word for it. And I've got a book that has, it's called the Interlinear Greek, and it has the Greek New Testament with the English translation underneath. And I looked up Romans 8.1, and sure enough, the last part of that verse is not in the Greek. It's not there. It doesn't exist. Okay? So my point is that this is how verse 1 should read. Therefore there, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, full stop. In other words, there are no conditions. Okay, That's, all, that's what the Greek says. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, full stop. There's no conditions. The only condition is that you're born again and in Christ. Once you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you ever again. Not for your whole eternal life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. You know, why did the translators add that extra bit in who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit? Because they couldn't handle the naked truth. They couldn't handle what this was saying. They thought this is too good to be true. There's no way that we could translate like that. People would get the wrong idea. They'd just go out and, and sin all over the place if they, if they knew there was no condemnation. Well, they didn't understand grace, did they? Because Jesus was full of grace and he never sinned once. Sin doesn't, uh, grace doesn't cause people to sin. But there's another reason that there's no condemnation for us. You know, think about when somebody breaks the law. And under, you know, in, in our word, uh, civilian law today, if somebody breaks the law, there is a punishment. There is a consequence. They go to prison for a certain amount of time. They pay a fine. Uh, so there's a judgment and people are punished. But once that punishment is fulfilled, then there's no more condemnation, is there? It's over. I mean, you'd be crazy to carry on punishing yourself after you'd fulfilled or paid your fine. You know, if you got a speeding ticket and paid your fine, you're not going to give them $100 every month for every year afterwards. That would be silly, wouldn't it? Okay. Once it's paid, it's paid. Now, now look down at verse 3. What the law could not do, and what the law could not do is it could not make us perfect. Okay. It was impossible because it was weak through our flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, once sin has been judged and condemned once, it doesn't need to be judged and condemned again. You seeing the picture here? Jesus, who became sin with our sin, he received the full condemnation, the full judgment, the full wrath of God against sin on his body. And then, of course, we know he descended into hell three days and three nights and rose again from the dead. But remember on the cross, he said it is finished. It was paid for. It was dark for three hours. That's when God had to turn his back on his son. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And during those three hours, the wrath of God was poured out on sin, which happened to be upon his son, Jesus. You see, that's why there's no more condemnation. Because all of our sins, past, present and future, were laid on Jesus. And God's full judgment was born in the body and soul of Jesus Christ. Sin was condemned in the flesh. And so when you and I sin, it's already been paid for. There is no condemnation. God would be unjust to judge that sin again. You can't do that. There's no judge in this world that could judge a crime a second time after it's been fully paid. And God certainly wouldn't do that. God is a just judge. You see, so there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's every single one of us. There's no more condemnation for your life. It's not going to happen. Now, the only way that we could get under condemnation again is if we helped the devil to do it. Now, let me explain that. Under the old covenant, the law, which man could never keep, was given to show us our need for a savior. In a nutshell, that was it. Okay. So we would never have known sin, the Bible said, unless the Bible said, do not do this and do not do that. That's the reason it was given, so that we know we, we were sinners, we were rotten to the core, and we needed a brand new spirit, which we got. Okay, And so it, the Bible calls it the handwriting of requirements that was against us. What's it referring to? The Ten Commandments. Okay, 
Moses up Mount Sinai received the Ten Commandments of God on two tablets of stone. God wrote those commandments with his, with his own finger. Okay? And the first set, remember, Moses broke them. Moses is the only man to break the Ten Commandments. <laughs> he broke them all in his anger. And see, that's a picture straight away of man's inability to keep the commandments. Straight away, God gave him these brand new commandments. He smashed them on the ground. <laughs> it just shows straight away a perfect example. And so what did God do another time? Moses went up the mountain again with some new stones. God wrote in them again. And this time Moses held on to them. And we know them today as the Ten Commandments. Now, the commandments are good. The Bible says the commandments are good. They're holy. They're just. Okay. But they have no power to make us good and holy and righteous. They don't because of the weakness of our flesh. Only Jesus could do that. And so the enemy, knowing that man could never fulfill God's holy law, whenever we failed to obey a commandment, the enemy would come along and condemn us. He would come along and accuse us. Okay? But when Jesus came and fulfilled the law perfectly and hung on the tree and bore the curse of the law, and gave us the gift of righteousness and no condemnation, then it says the old covenant was set aside. It was fulfilled. It was no longer necessary now for the believer. Okay, it's still necessary for someone who doesn't know Christ yet because they have to come to Christ. Okay, and so Satan has now been disarmed. In fact, let's go to the scripture in, in Colossians. Colossians. Uh, we find that just after Philippians, I think it is. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, chapter 2. Let's read from verse, uh, goodness, verse 13. Colossians 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, that's Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay? You see the picture? Okay, those commandments were against us. We could never fulfill them. And the enemy came alongside them to use it against us, to condemn us. But notice it says, God nailed those things to the cross with Jesus. Okay? Now, but notice the next verse. It says, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So how did he disarm Satan? By nailing the Ten Commandments to the cross. In other words, Satan now has nothing by which he can accuse us, unless we put ourselves back under the commandments. Unless we fall into that trap of saying, well, I was saved by grace, but I guess I'm, need to, I'm going to need to work hard now to become a better person. The moment you do that, you put yourself back under the commandments and you've just rearmed Satan. You've just rearmed the devils and the demons to come along and give you a hard time. Because the moment you start focusing on yourself, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fail. You're going to disappoint. You're going to let yourself down. And you'll just go down and down and down. The harder you try, the worse it'll get. Okay? And so that's the strategy of the enemy is to get us to look at ourselves, especially when we fail, he'll... He'll come alongside and say, wham, you think you're a Christian. You think you're the righteousness of God. Look at what you just did. And he'll come along and make you feel real bad about yourself and think, well, yeah, if I was really a Christian, I wouldn't have done that. I would have walked in love. And, and you think to yourself, man, I must try harder next time. The moment you start saying that, I must try harder, you just put yourself back under the law. And Satan's going to be right there to give you a hard time. And so... The Holy Spirit doesn't, remember, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to convict us of sin. He comes us to convict us of our sonship. And so when we blow it, the Holy Spirit comes to remind us who we really are so that we can rise up to that. He doesn't condemn us. No, he says, I love you. I believe in you. You're going to do better next time. We can do this. That's, that's how he approaches us, okay? And so I'd never seen that verse in context before, you know. He disarmed principalities and powers because he nailed the commandments to the cross condemnation was finished with for us isn't that amazing now think about it Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall of man they, they knew nothing about condemnation they didn't give it a second thought they weren't looking at themselves they weren't looking at any failures were they 
No, they were just enjoying God's presence. And so now you can understand there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now let's look back at Romans 8, uh, the end of the chapter. Romans 8, right at the end of the chapter. We'll look at verse uh, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And uh, it asks the question, but notice what answer it says. It says, it is God who declares righteous. So who shall bring an accusation against us? And it's obviously in brackets, it's kind of saying, well, definitely not God, because God's the one who makes us righteous. You see that? It's important that you can see that. Who is he that condemns? Then it says, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So it's definitely not Christ Jesus that condemns us. Why? Because he's praying for us. <laughs> You see, it's not God who accuses us. No, God makes us righteous. It's not Jesus who condemns us because Jesus is praying for us. Right now, Jesus Christ has a full-time ministry, a position at the right hand of God, praying for you and I. What? So that we could come into the fullness of his grace, the fullness of his finished work. So he's certainly not condemning us. He'd be working against himself. Now, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril or sword? Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Notice why we're conquerors. Notice why we're victorious. Is it because of our love for him? No, it's because of his love for us. You see, notice this chapter starts off with there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, what does condemnation do to people? It separates them from the love of God. Mm. The moment you can't come under condemnation, you're in a place where, well, I don't think God really loves me just because of what I just did right then. Isn't that true? Mm. Condemnation comes to try and give the appearance that we're separated from the love of God. But what's Paul saying here? He's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yeah. And if you're going to be more than a conqueror, you have to know that there's no more condemnation for you. Because if you get under condemnation, you're not going to be a conqueror. You're going to feel like God's a million miles away, like he doesn't love you anymore. But nothing shall separate us from his love. You see that? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know what? You know, people um, even talk about the great commandment, you know, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, has anybody been able to fulfill that? No. <laughs> See, that's under the law, isn't it? That's the law. Nobody can do it. Why was the law given? To make us realize we can't do it. Now, what else does the Bible say, though? It says we love because he first loved us. You see, law says you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. No man can do it. No, we love because he first loved us. He that is forgiven much will also love much. You see, it's a response. It's not law. And if love was under the law, it wouldn't be love. You see that? Mm -hmm. Love is a true love is a response. You can't demand love. You can't command love. You see, it's under the law. We love because he first loved us. And this says in verse 38, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the chapter st starts with, there is therefore now no condemnation, and ends with nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. See, there's a link there. We've got to get free of this condemnation thing so that we can walk in the love of God. God loves us all the time. God loves us in our worst day. He never changes that. Nothing we can do to make him love us less. 
Nothing we can do to make him love us more. Now let's look at, um, in the Gospels now, John chapter 7. We already looked at a, one instance with a woman who was known as a sinner and how Jesus embraced her. But let's go to John. Oh, here it is. Yeah, sorry, John chapter 8, right at the beginning of the chapter. Okay. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives... Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And you know, we were just saying earlier about the fact that under the old covenant when Moses received the law and came down the mountain, the people scattered. <laughs> they were scared, they were terrified. But whenever Jesus spoke, grace dripped from his lips. People came to him. Children came to him. You see, the law pushes people away, but grace attracts people to it. So early in the morning he came to the temple, he sat down and taught the people. Verse 3, Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they set her in the midst. And this is quite, I don't know, it's one of these bizarre things. There's a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Now, you've got to ask yourselves, what were these Pharisees doing to catch a woman in adultery? I mean, were they peeping through the window? I mean, think about it. You know, use your brains. I mean, they had to witness this somehow. And you notice the other bizarre thing about the story is where was the man? Mm. <laughs> you know, last time I... It takes two, right? <laughs> where was the man? How come they only brought the woman? Could have been that the man was one of the Pharisees. Just a thought. Okay, so kind of bizarre situation. But that's what the law does to people. Mm. The law makes people weird. And causes them to blame people. And so they, they, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Obviously, these guys are trying to set Jesus up. They're trying to get him to somehow speak against the law of Moses. And that way they could completely discount him and say that this man is a fake. All right. And so in verse 6, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. <laughs> you get the picture? You know, these guys are accusing Jesus, asking him questions, and he's not taking any notice. He just puts his finger on the ground. He's writing on the ground, looking down at his finger. These guys are doing whatever they're doing. So when they continued... Asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now what he's saying to these guys, these guys are going on about, oh, the law of Moses, the law of Moses. And Jesus, remember the finger of God that wrote the Ten Commandments? Mm. So Jesus puts his finger in the ground in the clay. We don't know what he's writing. But he's thinking to himself, guys, you're talking about the law. You don't know who wrote it. I was the one who wrote it. You tell, you're talking to me about the law? Hey, I'm the one that wrote the thing. Okay? Now, notice he did it twice. Remember, he looked up. He stooped down and did it again. Why did he do it twice? Because Moses broke the first bunch of commandments, didn't he? He broke the first lot of stamp tablets, and God had to do it a second time. So Jesus was saying very clearly, I wrote the law, and you're talking to me about the law? And so he says to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her at first. Or well, he is without sin, cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the <coughs> oldest, even to the last, even the oldest Pharisee. Okay? Now, this was, this was groundbreaking because up to this point, the Pharisees all thought they were perfect. They all thought that they had kept the law perfectly. Okay? And so this was, a, this was a huge embarrassment to them. They tried to trick Jesus, but Jesus caught them in their trickery. Okay? And he said, he who is without sin can cast the first stone. And it says they were convicted in their conscience. In other words, they were pricked in their heart. Why? Because they knew now that they were not without sin. That was a huge revelation to them. They hadn't had that conviction probably ever before. Okay? This was a huge revelation to those Pharisees that, yeah, I've kept the law outwardly, but 
hey, I know I'm a sinner. I do not have the right to take the life of that woman caught in adultery. This was a huge revelation to them. Okay. And so when Jesus has raised himself up, verse 10, and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, looked around, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, what did Jesus do? He gave her the gift of no condemnation. No condemnation. In other words, she was forgiven. And he said, go and sin no more. And again, you know, the law people were coming on that. See, so Jesus told that woman to go and not sin anymore. But Jesus gave her a gift first. He gave her the gift of grace. He gave her the gift of no condemnation. You see, now grace teaches us to live right. Grace empowers us to live right, not by our own efforts, but by the grace of God, by God's empowerment in our lives. Okay? So he didn't tell the woman under the law, go and sin no more. No, he says, he says woman, you're forgiven. You're empowered. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. You can live a new life now. You see that? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No wonder Jesus got such a hard time from the Pharisees. But see, notice there, he didn't break the law of Moses, did he? He didn't speak against the law of Moses. No, he, he, he acted right within the law. But there was no one there. Jesus himself could have stoned that woman. He's the only one there that was qualified to do that because he was perfect. But he didn't. Why? He couldn't. Why? Because he was full of grace and truth. That's all that he could give to that woman. So he gave her grace. Now let's finish in um, Matthew 17. This is, this is really cool. Matthew 17, Matthew 17, verse 1. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Now, straight away, contrast this with Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. When he received the law, it says there was darkness, there was, there was fire, there was smoke. It was terrifying. But here's Jesus on another mountain, and it's glorious, it's light, it's a totally different picture. Okay. But notice this, it says in verse 3, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now Moses, what does Moses represent? Moses represents the law on Mount Sinai. Elijah represents the prophets on Mount Carmel. Okay? Remember, Jesus says, the law and the prophets talk about me. Okay? And so here's Jesus now on another mountain. It doesn't say what mountain it is, but it said it's a very high mountain. Okay? And now notice that Moses has moved from his mountain to Jesus' mountain. Mm. Notice that Elijah has moved from his mountain to Jesus' mountain. Okay? Why? There's been a change. Why? There's a new covenant happening here. Remember some of the disciples uh, went out with Jesus one time and there was a, a city that didn't receive them. And Peter, James and John, the same three guys called the sons of thunder, they said to Jesus, Jesus, we need to call fire down from heaven on these dudes. They didn't listen to us. And what did Jesus say? You don't know what spirit you're of. Why did they say that? They were thinking of Elijah. They were thinking of the prophets of judgment in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, you, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's not for this dispensation. That, that was for the old dispensation. That's finished. And so Moses now has come off his mountain. He's come up Jesus' mountain. Elijah's come down from his mountain, and he's come up Jesus' mountain. You know, today, there's no such thing you know, as, as a prophet speaking judgmental prophecies. That's done away with. That's finished. Jesus bore our judgment. Jesus bore our curse. If somebody gets up and says that God's sending earthquakes to judge America... That's, that's not valid under the new covenant. Mm. No, see, Elijah's come down off that mountain. He's, off, he's on Jesus' mountain now. And see, they're talking with Jesus, okay? Now, Jesus said that the law and the prophets witnessed Jesus. They bore witness of Jesus Christ. It says that in the Gospels, the law and the prophets. Now, we have a fulfillment of that right here. Here's Moses and Elijah bearing witness of Jesus Christ. They're talking to him. They're now witnessing Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, Peter, good old Peter. Peter answered and said to him, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, 
let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, Jesus, let's have law, let's have judgmental prophecy, and let's have grace all camped together. <laughs> that was their attitude. Okay. Sorry, that was Peter's attitude. God, that's great that all three of us are here. Let's, let's have a camp for each. Let's have a law camp. Let's have a, a prophet camp, a school of the prophets, and let's have a grace camp. <laughs> Good old Peter. Okay. Now, notice this. You've you got to get this. Okay. While he was still speaking, this is Peter speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, not them. 